let me once again repeat myself and welcome you to the series of six studies on the two chapters of the book of Agai. And let us pray. Father in heaven, in the name of Jesus Christ, we invite you with gratitude, knowing that you are already in our midst, as it is written, where two or three are gathered in my name, they are mine, they are missed. So Lord, get, Lord, take perfect control and let eternity glorify your name and account of this moment and the ripples thereof. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Once again, you're welcome. The book of Agai has two chapters. You know, by way of introduction, prophetic ministry is God's elective gift. Since the time of Abraham, once in scripture, God told Abimelech that Abraham is a prophet. So in the time of Abraham, the ministry of prophecy has been God's own elective effort and gifts to his church. How complementary to the office of the governor and to the office of the priests has been well demonstrated by the ministry of Agai. Prophecy is not a decorative isolated panorama for speculation. It is complementary, complementary to the office of the governor, complementary to the office even of the priests, let alone the community. There are two, three negatives here that were on ground. And those negative effects of exile really put bitter haps on the lips of Jews. The first negative effect was the knowledge of scripture. I met a Jew once while in Jerusalem and talked about scriptures. I said, Bisha, I don't know. I will go. I'm from Benjamin, that's all I know. Their knowledge of scriptures became frosted because of by the era of Babylon, all the gods in captivity. The second negative effect of captivity or exile is economic hardship, cheap labor, slavery, in the community of exile and in back home in their community. And the third leg of the terrible exile is the en enemies of position on ground back home, as far as the reconstruction of the temple was concerned, temple and to buy all those who wanted to know how. So this tripod amounted to a formidable mountain. Indeed, it was a formidable trial. And those factors mystified, they put mists in the spiritual lenses of the governor. The governor was dazed. In the spiritual lenses, you may be priests, not to talk about the governed. But there was also a trial of prophetic team. If I go to the trial of prophetic team, they have been there 18 years. Nobody could touch the rubble of the temple and they had the stalemates. There was another trial. Daniel in far away Babylon perceived the expiration of exile, knowing that 70 years have passed, he started fasting far away to tell you that where you are has no limits to coordinating unified efforts of the children of God. Babylon was thousands of miles away. Daniel started fight, fasting. On ground, Zechariah and Agai, the ministered prophecy, the, the, the intercession of, Babel, of Daniel prompted God to give, to give revelation back home to two prophets, Zechariah and Agai. The, mini, the prophesied back home and the victory came through the governor Zerubbabel. The victory came through the people who summed up Cory to rebuild the ruins. You know, the New Testament recognizes the complementary offices for the community best mentioned in Ephesians. So when you are talking about Ephesians 4, 11 to 12, here's what it says. And his gifts were though such that he gave the church apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds or pastors and teachers for a purpose to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, 
for the building up of the body of Christ. I've given you one, two, three, four, five illustrations here. The fivefold ministry as one as one minister who is like the hand. That's the man's left hand pointing at you boldly on the extreme right are facing. The apostle, he made it the thumb. When you lose your thumb, the orthopedic surgeon will give you 50% damages. When the thumb is off, 50% of the function of your hand is off. You, I remember the retired primate of Nigeria, Akala. He was simply just consecrated and sent to Abuja to go and found a house. The apostle. There's the ministry of the prophets. There's the ministry of the evangelists. There's the ministry of the pastor. There's the ministry of the teacher. That is the hand of God. So the hand of God is typified as the hand with five fingers. With five fingers. And you find that a hand is off, a hand is on. Somebody made it like a building with five pillars, fivefold ministry. In the middle, you can see the clenched fists. You need the fingers of the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, pastor, the teacher to grip the ministry. Each finger is important. When you remove your finger, your Try it where you are. Your firmest grip is when all fingers are making a clinch. On the left top top, you know, corner, you can see those five poles. Don't mind which is taller. Each of them has a crown. So you go to white garment, they make you in prophecy. You go to deeper life, they like a deep Bible study. It doesn't matter the major of the ministry. God is. God is saying we all need all each other. And when the finger, when the hand is not clenched, the church cannot grip anything firmly. So for Zerubbabel, for the government, the people, the prophets, they need a coordinated ministry. That's the issue. That's the prophecy of Agai and the prophecy of Zechariah was so important. And in Ephesians, the Bible continues, God chose all of them for the sake of the equipping of the saints to build up the body of Christ for one purpose, until we all attain to the unity of faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of change. When you're not benefiting from the fivefold ministry, you are a puppet. You may be wearing gray hair like one someone that was preaching today. There are many people in the church with biological age of gray hair. They are not mature, they are just converts. They've remained converts for 60 years because they are shallow. But back home, the 18 years still is needed to have a breakthrough. And it was through coordinated effort of the prophets, of the priests, of the governor, of the people to build. Let's come back to our guy. Like we just see down below on my right, no tripod ever stands on two legs. All gifts are complementary. You cannot start a church. You cannot found a church based on only prophecy. You will crash. You cannot say you are orthodox. You can only you are a historian. All this jargon of prophecy is all for all time. You will crash. You cannot say you are only just to build structures with prosperity. You will crash. No tripod stands on two legs. In the unbroken nature of scriptures, we see the messianic footprint in the life and ministry of Zerubbabel as prophesied through Agai. He prophesied that Zerubbabel was going to be the signet. Eventually, Jesus Christ was seen as a disguised future leader who would be the signet ring of the whole world. Let us talk about the person and the name of this prophet. 
in biblical names, the meaning of the name Agai simply means feast or solemnity. That's what that's known about him. But we also know, as much as not known about his person, we not much, if we even known about his geology. But we know that Agai was a descendant of Ephraim. If you see this tribal distribution of the map of Israel, Ephraim is about the center in that light green. In the center is where Jericho is found. Benjamin, very small, is where Jerusalem is. So the two, the two, the two tribes produce significant places and people and historicals. As not much is known about the genealogy of Agai, we know that while he was young, he came from Babylon to Jerusalem. He was one of the returnees from exile. He prophesied openly that the people should repent. And he saw him part the son of man in the temple. And thereupon he died and was buried near the tomb of the priests in the same way as them from the tribe of Ephraim, as somebody said, forever and ever, amen. He's doing you the brevity. Great men of God who ministered said little about themselves. So was Agai. When you see the Old Testament timetable of centuries, you start from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, 1,200. They featured within the scope of 200 years. Israel in Egypt spent 400 years minimum. The Exodus took 40 years and featured Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings, 2nd Kings Chronicles. The next 400 years saw these people feature from Exodus to King David and they ministered. In the crowded 400 years from the King David to captivity, you see the ministry of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. And you now see in the Babylonian captivity section of 70 years as prophesied by Jeremiah, as noticed by Daniel, another 100 years of captivity, so 170 of the time of Ezekiel far away in Babylon. And with that little angle up there showing 500 BC, you see a bracket of Agai, a focus of study, Zechariah, they were twin prophets in Malachi, Ezra, Nehemiah, Ephter. So before you come to Jesus Christ, the Old Testament can be laid out, glare, talking about 2000 BC, 1500 BC, 1000 BC by King David. And when you are now coming to 500 BC, we are talking about the minor prophets and post-captivity prophecy. The prophet Agai recorded his four messages to the Jewish people of Jerusalem in 520 BC. Like I told you, 18 years after the return from captivity, they had 18 years of hard labor of groaning right in their own land when mischief kept them silent. That's to tell us that Agai was over 70 years by the time he delivered these prophecies because he came back from Babylon, he had seen it before. How could you know? It's written in Agai chapter two, verse three. When he completed the temple after 18 years of stalemate, he said, who of you who is left? Who saw this house in its former glory? How does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? That means he saw the temple of Solomon. Let me give you comparative figures. The left facing the, script, facing the screen is the second rebuilt temple where everybody was jubilating and blowing trumpets. And those who saw the former one were crying because it's all in ceramics. 
The temple of Solomon is all in gold, all plated in fine gold. Where you can see that the creature, where they wash their hand is in fine gold, where they will do ablution is in fine gold. Everything, when you see a cross section of the temple of Solomon, everything inside is coated with pure gold. Those were the things scattered away. The golden vessels were just a child's play of the treasure they lost. Pure gold, pure gold. Under it is the rubble, is what they reduced it to. And nobody dared touch it for 70 years, plus another 18 years, until on the right top, it was rebuilt through prophetic encouragement, through coordinated tripod of prophecy, governance, and people cooperating. So the older prophets was Agai, the younger was Zechariah. That means Agai was the older ones who could tell them how the former temple looked like. And it was much older by the time two of them delivered the prophecy of encouragement to the community. Still talking about this person, Agai. So from these facts, the picture of Agai begins to come into focus. He was an older man looking back on the glories of his nation. A prophet imbued with a passionate desire to see his people rise up from the ashes of exile and reclaim their rightful place as God's light to the nations. How do I mean? See the robbers, devastating, demoralizing. When you go to northern Nigeria, a lot of churches have been reduced to this. If much is said and much has been revealed by the Christian and others, then there will be a religious war in this nation. A lot of churches have been reduced to robbers. Some bishop will tell you the lost adjectives, not just churches, a group of churches. Burnt down, demolish. Those were the impacts of terrible captivity. And the people in those territories, they're in, in IDPs, internally displaced camps. So their pride of gold got raised down to what you're seeing as a rubble. And it was from these ashes of exile where the national pride, because the symbol of the pride of Israel was their temple. Where the national pride back home was just a ghost of itself for 70 years. The book of Agai is one of those books, well dated, well cited, punctuated by, by the exhuming of literacy. Four messages. It will tell you the first day of the sixth month of the second year of King Darius. That's the first message. The second message, the second, third, and fourth, they were in the second chapter, 21st day of the seventh month. The third one, 24th day of the ninth month. The last one, 24th day of the ninth month. Those who wrote scriptures, they were either prophets or teachers. Agai wrote the minor book of prophets. So just looking at the wordings of the prophecy, the first one said, in the second year of Darius the king, in those days, really, the, the, you know, the reference points couldn't be Christ. It was the most popular kings. In the second year of Darius the king, on the first day of the sixth month. So this prophecy came in the middle of the year. The word of the Lord came by the prophet Agai to Zerubbabel, the son of the son of Shedel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of. So he was telling you specifically, God sent me to the governor, God sent me to the priests. The second message, in the 24th month, in the 120th day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Agai, referred to himself in the third person. The third, on the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Agai. It's like an attestation, it's like swearing and a tragedy. And the last one, and again, that means that same month, 
the word of the Lord came unto Agai in the fourth and twentieth day of the month. So there was a lot of evidence of scholarship, scientific documentation, specificity as to who delivered the message, to, who delivered, to whom the message was delivered, and what God was saying. Unlike most of the other prophets, Agai explicitly dated his prophecies down to the day, and he gave four separate messages. So these messages encouraged the people of Judah to finish building the temple and to have hope in God for the promise of blessings in the future. We needed to know domestics of a few IDPs daring to go back and they were killed. To say you want to go back to where the ruins are, you need courage, you need the grace of God. If not, you have only gone to commit political suicide. What is the history of Agai? In the sixth century, he helped to mobilize the Jewish community for the rebuilding of the Temple of Jerusalem after the Babylonian exile, and he also prophesied the glorious future of the Messianic age, two chapter book. There are 12 minor prophets. They are called minor prophets, not because they are minor, it's because they Quantum, if you go to the length of the prophets of the books they wrote was short. That's why they, if, if, I, if Isaiah has 66 chapters, you cannot talk about a two chapter book and not call it a minor prophet while Isaiah was major. So, Agai was the tenth of the list of the minor prophets, which are Obadiah, whose name means servant of Jehovah, Joel, Jehovah is God. Jonah, just a dove, Amos, body bearer, Hosea, salvation, Micah, who is like the Lord, Zephaniah, which we may be doing after Agai, Jehovah Heights, Nahum, consolation, Abacoc, embrace, Agai, either festive or festival. Those are literal meaning. And the dates in which the, 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 the minister, Zechariah, whom Jehovah remembers, we've done Zakari on this platform. And Malachi means my messenger, we've done my Zakari. So a guy is the one. Now, how do we now summarize at a glance the book of our guy? His first sermon of about 15 verses had to do with conviction. It was a rebuke, it was a reminder, and people responded. The second sermon, it's all about courage, the presence of God, and the peace of God in doing what they were supposed to do. He thought someone is talking about cleanliness. Corrupt, you know, where, where something is being defiled, defilement, dependency. And the fourth sermon, futuristic, the sovereign king is coming, and he had a stamp, the signet ring, which emperors in those days wore as a mobile seal for presidential direction. Yes, the genesis of the encouragement was from far off. One man called Cyrus, a hidden king. Cyrus's regime over Persia gave the Jews in his jurisdiction leave to return and restore the temple. And in the words of Cyrus, who is there among you? God has told me to build a Jerusalem temple. I now said in Ezra chapter one verse three, who is there among you? of all his people is God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah. See these words, and build the house of the Lord God. That's it, he then, the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. So the status symbol of the pride of Israel was the temple. Even it's still the temple, although they have just a parchment of retaining wall, and he talked about the vessels being returned and the vessels also of gold, of silver, and of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of his temple that was in Jerusalem. That was the, that was the, those are the vessels that one man called Belshazzar trifled with and, and ended his regime in brevity of assassination because it is not the temple of the, the vessels. 
So Cyrus gave the directive, but there was a stalemate during his time, it was not done. So his regime of Apatia gave the Jews jurisdiction to return. I could see over the fence of Jerusalem, college to go and do what they were supposed to do. Those people peeping over the fence, they are taskmasters, Ambala and Toeba, who will say, Not in our life. Not, not, not in our life will it happen. So, making sense of history, Zerubbabel, the governor, and Ezra, the priests, they featured in the dynamics of returning Jerusalem and the temple to its former glory. So when we are now talking about Darius who succeeded Cyrus, who appointed Zerubbabel as governor with specific assignments for the continuation of this building of the temple, that is where Zerubbabel featured when the prophecy of Agai was come to come on the ground. You know, when you, when you remember answers, the riot to Nigeria, when you remember a few things, then you know that even governors could be frightened because of terrible opera against governance. So talking about rebuilding the temple, it almost became, you see, the returnees found, they came back, even living, making a living was tough. Building their own accommodation was difficult. And the temple rebuilding to its former glory proved almost impossible. You can see the wretched people just came raw on open ground. No wood, no nothing, no protection, no wall. How can you not tell us to build a temple? So pioneers, they could tell, they, they, they could tell you gallons and volumes of, 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 rec, of recording of things that make God's work almost impossible. So they work on the temple, they have for six. They, tried, they started and they just abandoned it after 14 years. That was the prelude to the ministry of Agai. You now see the old Agai, maybe the one in the middle, and the younger one, Zekara. And Agai and Zekara, they helped Zerubbabel, the governor, to gain the support needed to resume the work. They needed psychological encouragement. They needed spiritual encouragement. They needed political encouragement. And if you are with us during the study of, of Ezra, when they went back and they were being accosted, they said, somebody, we had an information. And those people were part. When God wants to help you, the law enforcement agency, who used to be negative, will just suddenly become paralyzed. That's what happened. When God is in it, there's much in little. So I guys seem to have viewed the temple restoration as an end to Gentile rule. You will see carvings of this, of this prophet trying to encourage the king, the Zerubbabel governor, to get on with the job. Carvings were there in archives. And the book of Agai is important for two or three following reasons. One. It laid the foundation of latter Judaism on which Christianity later was to be built. Ezra came and for six to 12 hours, they were on their feet listening to the word of God. He taught them scriptures. So when you see the symbol of the symbol of Islam, Christianity in the middle and the star of David, he's talking about the three major religions of the Middle East. And the, and, and the foundation is Judaism, followed by Christianity. Islam only came around 600 something after Jesus Christ had gone. Agai, secondly, is important because he created a platform link between worship and work, which is characteristic teaching of Jesus Christ and the New Testament. Don't become what they call, if you are too spiritual, you become a fanatic. If you are too secular, you just become an agnostic. You need a balance. And for Jesus Christ, work is worship. So when they say, here, oh, Israel, the Lord our God, you, you worship the Lord with all your, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Worship, work is worship. 
And when you now have a complementary rise now to build the temple, it was work, but it was to worship and honor God. So work is worship dedicated to God. That's an important message in Agai. The next third important message, he revived hope in the dejected community. All of a sudden, who has, no, there was no Riyadh for answers. People just came together and there was hope. We can, we can make a point, come what may. So that hope made for unity. This is what God is looking for, Christianity all over the world. We are disunited, compartmentalized in too many divisions of the world. God told, showed the joiner the picture of the church as a prison yard or is either a prison yard or a hospital where well, there are regulations. Don't go there, don't go there. That denomination is not good. These ones are demonic. And if his children are united, there is nothing they will not be able to achieve. We will be mutually correctable. We'll be mutually learning. We'll learn from each other. We'll put into center the, 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 the talents and fruits we have. The church will move as a formidable body. That was a guy did with his prophecy. Hope. Another prophetic timetable. I don't want to bore you with historicals. But to say that there was a Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian onslaught of Jerusalem, the Greek took over the Alexander the Great, and, and so on and so forth, the Maccabean War, Israel in the epileptic ups and downs had always faced the hostility of the hand of God to correct them when they went into idolatry over the centuries. What else can you learn? from the book of Haggai. You can see the history of Israel, right from Genesis, Exodus, talking about the Israel, Israel beginning with Genesis chapter 12, all about Abraham. Abraham and his offshoots is all about Genesis to Kings, talking about Saul, David, and Solomon. Then you now have the misbehavior, taking them to 70 years back, captivity, before Ezra and Nehemiah came on ground to teach the laws. And in that arrow, you now see small remnant returning to the land to rebuild where Agai featured. So the entire history of Israel is keyed around the Bible before you get to the New Testament, which is separated from the Old Testament by two, four to 500 years, called 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. Before I stop talking, let us see the book of Agai. Chapter one is talking about wrong priorities. Do you build your own house first or the temple of God first? Chapter two is talking about three issues, working perspectives, incomplete purity, and encouragement promises. And when you see the Old Testament timetable, I've said that before, to come to the next reasons why Agai may be a focus of relevance in learning. The book of Agai is significant because it shows the importance of temple worship and obedience to God. Say it again. God does not joke with half truth. God does not have an advice. He has a directive. And when you obey what God is saying, you have hope. So that's the trumpet, that's the jubilation of what God told them, the way they should dedicate the temple, trumpet and things, when they were dedicating the temple, they made the Old Testament alive. Talking about the obedience, on the day the temple was dedicated, God told Solomon, I've heard the prayer and the plea you have made before me. I've consecrated this temple, which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. So when you dedicate something for God, believe me, you, me, he keeps watch over that place. And you can go into eloquent spree and deliveries about obedience and worship in the book of Psalms 5, 7. 
Because of your great love, I can come into your temple. Because I fear and respect you, I can worship in your holy temple. And Psalm 1, Psalm 11, verse 4, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold his eyelids try the children of men. What again? Psalm 65, verse 4, happy are those whom you choose, whom you bring life to your sanctuary. We shall be satisfied with the good things in your house, the blessings of your sacred temple. And Psalm 79, Psalm 79, again, you see in verse 1, Psalm 79, verse 1, God, the nations have come in to your inheritance, reporting situations to God. They have defiled your holy temple. They have laid Jerusalem in heaps. So God and his heritage, they are indivisible. Psalm 138, verse 2, talking about the relevance and importance of the name and the word of God. I will worship to your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your word above all your name. God does not joke with his word. He does not joke his name. So let us talk about quotable quotes in our time. Closeness to God. It's not about feelings. Oh, emotional feeling. It's about obedience. If God says those who hate me, he's talking about those who disobey him. How much you obey God is how much you love him. So closeness to God is not about feeling. It's about obedience. If you are living in sin and you are saying, I love you, Lord, you are just, you are just ridiculing yourself. Obedience to God, obedience to God will bring blessings to you and to others. You'll be a ripple of blessings. See this padlock? Obedience is the key to God's acts. That's one of the messages of rabbis. Once you obey, you have a key to God's heart. God has said he will not go with them. And Numbers 12, 3 say Moses was the most humble man on the face of the earth. When God came, he lied down and prostrated God. Please don't leave us alone. Go with us. He said, I will do my best to you. Once you obey God, you, are, you have the key to his heart. And like another person said, don't go outside of obeying God to get something because you will have to stay outside of God to keep it. Let me say it again. Don't go outside of God. Don't go outside of obeying God to get something. In other words, don't choose the carnal way because you have to stay outside God to keep it. One of the books says, carnal leadership will attract Canal followers. But canal leadership cannot make canal followers to become mature in Christ. So, all the gimmicks of the world, the things they are doing in the church will never make the congregation mature. That's why you find the church full of great converts, but not disciples. Amen, amen. And you are in the world of the world. By the time they have to be mature, they will know that what is in the Bible is different from what you are telling them. So, when we obey God, he gives us the light of his revelation and gets us where we need to go. Agai 1 2. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, These people say the time has not come, the time that the lost house should be built. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. So when you are talking about the dark art of procrastination, when we put God secondary, we meet dead ends and futility in our private life. And I was telling them, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? About 40, 50 years ago, I, I, I used to say when I was a medical student, you see VIPs gather. They descend to the church from palaces. They descend to the church from furnished sitting rooms. And the church is a ramshackle thing where you have few people sitting down. I say it should be the other way around. If God is so valuable, you will make the God's house the most desirable, and you will come from sheds. That was what Agai was saying. 
He also taught on polluted and corrupted animals. He said, anyway, he's going to be burnt as burnt as a sacrifice. We can manage this. That's one lamb with three legs. The one other one amputated. That's one big lamb with blind eyes. It, it came cheaper. So the people of Judah, and particularly the Levites, living among them, were also polluted and corrupt. They made money. As spiritual sons of the servants of the Lord, their offerings to God had become common and worthless. In as much as the sacrifices they made for the people typified the coming sacrifice of atonement of the Son of God. The Lamb was the future Son of God. How can Jesus Christ be named? The only acceptable sacrifice which was spotless. So the priests and the Levites of Malachi's day, they were mocking God by offering sacrifices to the Lord with sick, blind, and lame animals that calling them acceptable. When they want to count the money that comes from churches, most of the cashiers in the bank have to use masks, moldy notes, comble notes, tattered notes. Those are the things that come from the churches. Why do you think the Lord only accepted animal sacrifices that were perfect and without blemish? God is a, is a wonderful God. When they complied, when we comply, this prophetic will come. I will extend peace to her like a river. So when, when we do the right thing, God speaks the right thing. And in Agai chapter 2, verse 23, he's talking about the governor in the prophetic symbolism of the leader of Israel. I will make you like my signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord Almighty. Now, question about Zachariah and Agai. Then he said to me, this is the cause that goes out over the face of the old earth, Zechariah said. Every thief shall be expelled. According to the side, if this, if this, if this cause will be going around, they don't need the MCC. It will visit every thief. Every pajora will be expelled. The beam will get, and so on and so forth. Zechariah prophesied it. Why did the angel say to Zechariah, how many sides of this school? So, Agai zeroed on terrible things he did in the temple. Zechariah prophesied more of stealing and bribery and corruption in the society. Just for memory verses, this is from the book of Agai and discuss. Agai 2 9, the glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in the place which I give peace. Second one, go up to the hills and bring wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it, and that I may appear in my glory, says the Lord. Then speak Agai to the Lord. Agai the lost messenger in the lost message unto the people, saying, I'm with you, says the Lord. That was when he complied in 113. And in chapter 1, verse 4, he said, Is it time for you to dwell in your spinel houses? And my house lies waste. 